Happy Monday. We're back like we never left. It's your boy, Josh Jams, and this is Josh Answers, the place where I answer all your questions about gig life, playing music, booking shows, making money, and all the crazy lessons I've learned along the way in my career in music, and I'm sharing it with you. Now, today's question comes from a new place. It's actually not Reddit, it's LinkedIn. But before I jump there, I should tell you, I just posted last night a new Chaotic Covers. It's a mashup between Simple Man and Better Man, and gosh darn it, somehow it works. I don't understand it, but it does. So if you have not checked that out yet, head to my TikTok now. It's also on YouTube, so you might wanna see it there as well. Now listen, I get it. LinkedIn's not necessarily a cool place, but there are some people on LinkedIn that actually do contribute a lot and they're fun to follow. One of those people is Alex Paul of the Chainsmokers. Now, before I get too far, I must say, we allow no Chainsmoker hate on this channel, none. I remember two years ago when I was playing Creed at my shows and everyone was laughing at me and now here we are two years later, Tremonte and Scott Staff are getting back together and everyone's buying tickets like it was always the cool thing to do. Well, listen, I remember. And I'm gonna remember 10 years from now when you hear Closer on the radio and you're feeling nostalgic and you go back to the Range Rover with Blink-182 on the radio and I'll remember that you were hating on it back then. No chain smoker hate. Anyways, Alex Paul isn't just one half of the chain smokers. He's actually one half of Mantis VC, a venture capitalist fund that he started with his partner, Drew Taggart. And what they're doing is actually investing a lot into some forward thinking areas like AI, ML, enterprise, privacy and security, gaming, FinTech, I'm looking at the list, logistics, consumer and e-commerce, healthcare, ESG. Now, what does a band know about venture capitalists? Listen, if you've actually not lived a life on being on tour where the band can break down and you got to get to the next gig and figure it out with no money and nothing to eat, and if you don't get there, you're going to lose your gig, it teaches you a lot. And so I've loved watching Alex build this fund up and sort of show everyone the ability of someone that has been able to transcend a career in music to a whole different world of investment. Besides that point, there was an awesome post from Alec. He mentioned this question, this topic that comes up so often in the career of a musician. Should you play for exposure? And in his post, he talked about a conversation he had with someone who was being advised to not take gigs or play any kind of shows for less than their standard amount. Alex, on the other hand, said that they should. He said that early on, a big part of their work was trying to get as much exposure as possible. When you're trying to break into an industry, you have to prove yourself and the path isn't always clear. Maybe it's an internship, an open mic night, or a pro bono request. He goes on to talk about how them getting involved in venture capitalist investments is actually very similar, that early on they had to take small chunks of investments because they were being tested. Now, I actually have a personal experience with this exact question in music and I'll share it with you now. A lot of times people talk about the idea of playing for exposure and it's very negative. And honestly, it's negative for a reason because a lot of people out there take advantage of musicians who wanna play music and will offer shows that make no sense to be a part of or require a lot of work for you to, to take a part in or you know, are not worth the effort and time. But there are some gigs out there that are for exposure that are a good opportunity. And that's the distinction that you as a musician have to create and separate the two. One example of this was when I was in a band back at Penn State, and I was a senior at Penn State with two of my friends playing in a band, and really, we didn't have much in terms of gigs. We just wanted to play music with each other. So we got an offer from the local ski resort, shout out Tussie Mountain, and they said, hey, if you guys wanna come play in our lobby area, in like the cafe for when people get off the mountain, feel free, you can come out here on Thursdays, people are having some drinks, you can play some tunes for tips. Now, this drive to Tussie Mountain was not a, an easy one. You had to get in the car, drive up to where it's snowing. I remember us being in the car, the three of us with all of our equipment on our laps in this tiny little car, driving to this mountain to play music for free. And a lot of our friends were like, why are you going up? It's Thursday, it's Thursday, Thursday. What are you doing? You're gonna go play for free? Let's go out to the bar, let's go. Um, but we wanted to have uh, an opportunity to play music. We wanted to jam with each other. We wanted to learn how to entertain people. We wanted to learn how to take requests. And you know, it was early on and we really didn't have much in terms of opportunity. So what was our options going to be? And we took advantage of it. And we played these shows every Thursday, we'd drive up there, 
equipment in hand, and we do our best. We'd rock out, we'd take requests, we'd jam. It was like a little acoustic gig. And we didn't really think much of it, right? Like it was just kind of like a way for us to keep honing in our skills and nothing more than that. And again, when you're assessing these opportunities, you have to figure out what the upside is. They're not gonna present it to you. But if there is one there, like, hey, I need to practice. Let's practice in front of a live crowd. Or, hey, I need to work on my, my mic control. I need to work on how to take a request. I need to work on whatever it is, right? And there are those moments where you can get those pieces of exposure from those gigs. Six months later, this band was on tour, playing up and down the Jersey Shore, Maryland and Delaware. We'll talk about that transition, I'm sure, in a different video. But here I was, for the first time ever, playing music full time. We were doing as many as eight gigs a week, two on Sunday. And while we're doing these gigs, people are really enjoying it. The venues are actually loving us. It's going really, really well. And I got a phone call one day in the middle of summer. Random number, I pick it up. Hello? Yeah, Josh, this is uh, Tussie Mountain Manager. What's up, Tussie Mountain Manager? I didn't, I didn't realize you had my phone number. Yeah, yeah, I got it from Steve. Oh yeah, Steve's a good guy. Listen, do you wanna keep talking about Steve or should we do this example? Good point, let's get back to it. So anyways, I was thinking, can you guys come back to Tussie Mountain this summer in August? to perform, because we have a gig for you to open up for Rusted Root. Rusted Root? You mean Rusted Root from Send Me On My Way? Yes. You mean Rusted Root from Matilda? Yes. You mean Rusted Root from Ice Age? Yes. You mean Rusted Root from Enterprise Rental Car? The same. Amazing. The only problem was, we already had a gig booked, a paying gig, for money at the Jersey Shore. I remember calling my booking agent at this time and saying, hey, uh, we have this gig, it's a weekly gig at this bar at the shore, and we have an opportunity to play a free gig, but to open up for Rusted Root. And I'll never forget this conversation. Immediately, he was against it. Well, you have the gig, you have the paid money, you have this relationship you have to maintain, you have all the the and the da, and the da, and the da. Uh, and all those things didn't matter to me because I love Rusted Root. I still do, and I did back then. They were one of the bands that got me into playing music professionally. We used to play Semi On My Way as a band, ourselves, as our closer back then. So you can imagine what it felt like to get a call to open up for this band that, you know, a year earlier I was watching in the crowd. Now to be able to open up for them at a ski resort mountaintop in the middle of summertime in one of my favorite places on earth, Happy Valley. Now, what were we gonna do? The literal CEO of our agency is telling me, don't do this. We just got signed to this agency and we've been with them now for like three months and I'm about to throw a huge wrench into the equation. And I had this, this thought of like, what, what do we do? You know, like I, 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 do I play the gig for money? Do I, do I potentially risk that relationship and go play this gig that I wanna play with the band that could maybe provide exposure, but again, for free. And back then, I sort of looked into the future. <laughs> That's the way I approached it. I was like, will I look back on this moment and say, I'm glad I played the 12th time at the Springfield Inn in Sea Isle, or will I say, hey, I got to open up for Rusted Root. And that's what we did. And we called the Springfield Inn and they were so cool about it. They're like, yeah, hell yeah, go play with Rusted Root. And we went back to Tussie Mountain, that place that we played at so many times before for free, and everyone questioned why we were doing it. All of a sudden, now we are opening up for a touring band that has hit singles. And just like that, we're on the main stage. And so the lesson here is, number one, that those gigs for exposure can lead to more. And it's really difficult at the time to understand what those things can be. But if you can assess those short-term value, like practicing in front of a crowd, working on your instrument, playing new songs, mic control, whatever else you might be working on in a live setting. And you can assess the long-term opportunity, like, hey, maybe we could be able to play here in the future. You can really sort of figure out if that free gig is worth your time. Now, if you ever get a sense of, I'm getting taken advantage of, or the person that's trying to book you is not being respectful of you, run. Run, don't walk. Like there should never be a time, even if you're playing for free, that you ever should feel disrespected. That said, if the relationship's good, which it was, and you feel like you're getting an opportunity for yourself to do something for your own improvement, then go for it. Because for us, we got a shot, not even like three months later, to open up for a band that we loved. And what that gig with Rust Root did was actually let us to continue touring with them. We did five gigs in total, one at the Stone Pony in Asbury Park, New Jersey. I don't remember all the Springfield gigs, I'm sorry. 
but I remember every single gig I played with Rusted Root. And so you never really know what the opportunity will be. You never really know if the time spent will be worth it. But there is an opportunity cost. And if the other opportunities aren't there, for us, we had no other gigs. Hell yeah, we'll play a free show. And if you're in that same boat, go for it. And if you are in the world of LinkedIn and you're thinking about your career right now, there are a lot of lessons here that I think kind of transcend the music industry. You can position yourself to be a value asset to people, even if it's in your career. And even if they're not looking to hire you at that moment. But if you think about that as opening up a door to greater opportunity that you can walk through down the line, then I think you're thinking in the right direction. So let me know. Do you agree with Alex? Do you agree with me? Was this helpful? Do you like LinkedIn? Don't connect with me there. My DMs are flooded. But you can connect with me here. Make sure you subscribe or head to my TikTok or Instagram. It's joshjams underscore. And I'll see you next time on Josh Answers.